Hey everyone, how are we doing? Sorry, I was getting distracted responding to everyone in the Q&A and totally lost track of time, but we are starting at 12.35. So hey, welcome back to our first control end for the year. We are so, so, so excited um, to have you around. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I'd like to pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend um, that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Um, so first of all, thanks for joining us. It's so exciting to be back in this zone um, and this zone being the running these um, online sessions. We did take a little bit of a break towards the end of last year while we regrouped and got used to meeting people in person again, but we did hear from our community that this was something that was really valuable. And so we wanted to continue this in um, 2023. And so we have a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. Um, but the key focus for today is Investment 101. So I hope you have your lunch or your coffee or a snack and that you're ready to rumble because we're going to be moving through some need to knows about raising funding. Um, but first, I want to put this to you. 50% of founders want to raise capital for their startups. 50% of founders also label raising capital as one of their largest challenges. The end of 2022 and 2023 has proven that this might have shifted to be an even greater challenge and a greater need than it was before. So I just want that to sink in a little. Half the founders you meet need capital. Half of the founders you meet identify raising as a key challenge. But on the other side of the coin, we look at investors and we know that VCs invest in 1% or less of their deal flow. That's less than 1% of the opportunities that they see across their desk. That's less than one in 100 people. And so the reason that Control N is exciting this year and something that we really want to focus on is starting to go into some of these questions because if there is such a dichotomy between like those looking to raise funding, those that um, have access to funding, what can we do to help ourselves stand out, especially when the odds aren't necessarily in our favor? For us at Luna, we do see three key things that make a difference when raising. The first is your understanding. Do you understand the rules of how startup investment works and have you thought about it for your business? The second is your preparation. Are you prepared for what it actually takes to raise funding? And the third is your business. Have you done the work and prep in your business to make it a good case for investment? Now, for today, um, with everyone online, we're not going to be focused on making your business a good, a good investment case, but what we are going to be focusing on um, is point one and two, understanding and preparation. So while you're sitting here, um, listening in, I would love to invite you to do just one thing. Grab a piece of paper or grab your phone and write down just one burning question you have about raising funding, just one burning question. It can be absolutely anything. And if I haven't, or if Belinda and I haven't answered this by the end, just let us know. Um, so a few things, a bit of housekeeping before we um, go on. This webinar is going to run um, till about 1.30. Um, we're going to try and stop a little early at around 1.20 so we can take questions. Um, but if not, we'll try and answer questions as we go as well. So please put those in the Q&A. Um, and if, you, if you're not familiar with Zoom by now, the Q&A should be um, at the bottom of your screen. And, once you and um, we'll try and answer those as we go. After this session, we're going to be sharing recording and any resources um, that are mentioned today. But more excitingly than... Um, this just being Luna, we've also teamed up with an incredible partner, which is AWS. Um, and so we are super thankful for the support for running this event. And something that we have agreed um, for all of you who've come along is that you'll all have access to $5,000 worth of credits with AWS. We're going to be sharing that at the very end. So do stick around until then. But I want to throw it over to Lauren, who's helped set this up um, to say a few words. 
Thanks so much, Josh. And yes, thank you to Team Luna for being willing collaborators on this, this session to kick off the year. I think it's a great way to start 2023, as Josh mentioned, you know, the environment's changed, things are different to how they have been in the past year. But what is most important to also remember is the funding is available. It's just about getting the house in order. And I think this is the perfect session to kick off the year. These things take time and preparation, uh, but this will put you in a, in a really good place to, to consider your fundraising goals towards the end of the year. So yes, for us at, at AW, AWS, startups we're really just wanting to make sure we're providing that support at the earliest level uh, and give you give you the content that you need with the amazing partners in our ecosystem that are helping you get off the ground and hopefully that five thousand dollars of aws credits helps to go a little way as you start so all the best um for 2023 and getting those fundraising goals happening and back over to josh and belinda thank you lauren thank you so much so i thought we'd kick off with a few intros, just so you know why I sit with a massive sign behind me during these. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are Luna. We're a full service um, studio helping founders go from idea through to exit. We have three cross-functional teams that focus on client stage. And we offer legal, accounting, and education services for each of those. So we have a startup team. Our startup team is wholly focused around early stage businesses. Think the kind of things that you need within the first three years of running a startup, your first institutional round of investment. We have a high growth and scale up team that works with some of Australia's best startups to see them through from that, through that growth phase until they sell their businesses. And then we have our corporate and VC team that works with venture capital firms and corporates to help them understand startups and the investment space um, in the best way possible. Um, so we are a really, really dynamic team. Um, my name is Josh. I'm the head of labs in our startup team here at Luna. Um, as head of labs, I design, deliver programs around business skills, law for entrepreneurs um, and entrepreneurship. Um, and I, um, and the other part of that is I head up a team of lawyers and accountants that focus specifically on tailored services for businesses that are in the early stage of their life cycle. For me, I think the most exciting part. Um, we also have Belinda here today. Belinda, do you want to intro yourself? Sure. Thanks, Josh. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am Belinda. I'm a senior lawyer here at Luna, um, and I sit alongside Josh, specializing in sort of the early stage startups and investment. Um, and prior to Luna, I was at a big corporate practicing in sort of general corporate and M&A. So yeah, really excited to be here with you today. Awesome. So now that we've done the intro, said all the things we need to say, let's get to the valuable part of today, which is talking about investment 101. So what I'm going to do is just share my screen super quickly. We can see that there. Amazing. So, Linda, why don't you kick off and then we'll get going. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Okay. So, what is startup investment? Um, just at a very basic level, what we're talking about here today is startup investment, which involves a third-party investor giving your company money in exchange for a stake of ownership in your company, i.e. they become a shareholder and they own a portion of your company. Next slide, Josh, thank you. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page today, um, when we talk about taking on investment, we're talking about issuing new shares in your company um, in exchange for money. So we're not talking about you as a founder um, selling or transferring your own personal shares in exchange for money. This is something that usually happens at you know, the later stage when you look to sell your business. Um, instead, we're talking about issuing brand new shares in your company to a third party investor. And the reason you're not selling your personal shares is because you wanna take money from the investor and put it into the company. That money is not going to you personally. Cool. All right. So what do startup investors want? The million dollar question. Um, the key reason why investors are giving you their money is that ultimately they want to see a return on investment. And this return on investment is really gonna hinder on the continued growth of your company. So it's a little bit different to traditional investment. Let's say you invest your money into the property market and you're expecting a return within sort of one to three years. Um, startup investment is more of a medium to long-term bet for investors. Um, they're going to expect a return according to a defined timeline. And 
This defined timeline is really going to depend on the stage of your company and where, you, where you're at in your sort of growth journey. Um, but for more sophisticated investors, so we're talking about our VCCR, the magic number really is 10. So they invest in your company, they're going to expect a tenfold return on their investment within 10 years. Think of that magic number as 10. More often than not, this return on investment is achieved through sort of two big events, and that will be the sale of your company or an exit event, or potentially an IPO, so the listing of your company on the stock exchange. Over to you, Josh, on type of investors. Yeah, so when we start talking about startup investment, there are a whole bunch of different investors that you have access to, to raise capital from. And the difference between each of these investors will really depend on the stage of your business. And we're going to go into that in a little bit, but I did want to touch on what each of these are. The first is that we have venture capital funds. Venture capital funds pull together money um, from a range of different partners for the specific purpose of investing in startups. Um, venture capital is extremely popular um, and has a significant amount of capital to deploy. We have a few $1 billion funds here in Australia, and that's an absolutely incredible opportunity for startups. Um, and the business of venture capital um, pretty much asks that a venture capital fund has a 10 year life cycle. And within the first few years of that life cycle, they're deploying their capital into startups and over that life cycle, seeing them grow. In order to raise another fund, the venture capital fund needs to make returns for their investors. So it's inevitable that if you are taking money from a venture capital fund, that sale is probably on the cards for your startup at some point. Remember that return on investment point. Corporate venture capital is very similar to venture capital, except it's corporates um, like um, ANZ. Um, investing into startups um, as sometimes as, a, as an economic value for them, for them, like economic future value, sometimes it's future-proofing and getting access to the best innovation for their own business. Um, next, we have angel investors. Angel investors are high net wealth individuals that invest their personal capital into high risk investments and are mandated that they're actually allowed to by law. Now, an angel investor has the incredible ability of potentially having industry experience, um, investing their personal money so they can generally make it happen a little bit quicker and often are able to get a bit more involved in your business, especially at that earlier stage. Um, angel syndicates are also incredible. They're pooling together groups of angels to invest larger amounts of capital into startups. This is a really, really, really great opportunity for you to look into angel syndicates as a potential option and saying, well, if I can just impress this angel syndicate, maybe I'll have access to a much larger network of angels. Um, next up, we have venture financing. Venture financing is also um, quite new, but gaining in popularity. One of the big players in Australia is Tractor Ventures and um, venture financing essentially gives the opportunity for startups that are traditionally not um, able to take on loans from banks because of um, personal guarantees and um, a lack of business activity, um, gives them access to certain types of loans. Venture financing generally reserved for startups that have sustainable or reliable revenue. Um, and then we have family offices. Family offices are high net wealth families that invest money through a diverse portfolio. So they'll invest in property and the public market, but they're also starting to invest more and more in startups. We're seeing more and more family offices starting to play, starting to play in the startup space. And I think all of these together have been building. When I started working in the startup space seven years ago, this it wasn't as developed as it is today. And seeing all of this and all of the opportunities here, there's never been a better time to get investment. Um, but the macroeconomic situation does mean we have to do a little, do things a little bit differently um in each of these areas do we and so we have a question from an anonymous attendee do you have lists of examples of the big players for each of these groups um the very very first resource that i'm going to recommend for finding out who the big players are is airtree has an investor list on their website um and i highly recommend going to check that out and um, we'll also share the link in the follow-up email to this, but Airtree has an investor list. That's a great place to start. It has a whole heap of information around different investors from angels through to corporate venture capital um, on, that, on, on that list. So how do you take money? Well, 
there are a whole bunch of different ways to bring investment into your business. Um, and one might be better for you than the other at a particular point in time. So priced equity round is what we're talking about today predominantly, which is the exchange of money, um, and the money in exchange for shares in your business. Um, but then moving along the line, we also have convertible notes and safes. Convertible notes or safes are essentially like promises to an investor and you say, hey, investor, um, I'd love to offer you shares, at my, shares in my company in the future. Um, because it's a little bit early for us to determine, number one, what our valuation is, um, a little bit early for us to do a full priced equity round. Um, but in exchange for coming on early, we're going to give you a bit of a discount at the next time we raise funding. So the next time you raise funding, you raise funding at a dollar a share. You've already provided this early investor a 20% discount. They'll be able to buy shares at 80, 80 cents a share. What this means, they're just getting more bang for their buck. Um, and this is re a really great uplift to think, well, if, if I've given you $100,000 and investors in the next round are paying $1 a share and I only have to pay 80 cents, instead of giving 100000 shares, I now get access to 125,000 shares. And that's absolutely massive. Um, we also have equity crowdfunding. Equity crowdfunding is really growing here in Australia. We have amazing players like Virtual um, playing in the equity crowdfunding space. Equity crowdfunding is incredible because it allows um, everyday investors to invest as little as 50 bucks into your company in exchange for a piece of the pie. It allows you to bring on really loyal advocates to also be involved in your journey in a bit of a different way. The equity crowdfunding we see working best with consumer facing businesses um, and ones that you do need to invest into marketing and brand in order to get your campaign to work really well. So recommend looking at equity crowdfunding and chatting to one of the providers to see if it's actually right for your type of business. Then we have loans like bank loans. This can sometimes be a bit stressful for founders because they might ask you to hold on, have a personal guarantee over that loan. That means um, putting your house or your car or your assets up for grabs if you're unable to repay that. And in running a business, maybe that's not something that you want to do. And there's also government grants. Government grants are an incredible option um, for gaining your initial, some initial rounds of capital, but government grants are extremely difficult and competitive and also quite unreliable. So if you do have access to government grants, I think they're amazing, but also think about the time trade-off that you put into writing those grants and the likelihood of success. And would it be better just to go and make sales in your business? Um, so there are all the ways that you can take money. So when we ask the question, why take investment at all? And I think, you have to be conscious around the reason that you do want to take investment. Because if you don't think that you can get to your next milestone without it, if you think giving up 15 to 25% of your business is a good deal to help you get there, is there strategic reasons that you want to take on investment? Say you want to gain market share or gain customers to take on that investment. You might be able to expand your network through investors themselves or might be keep, just give you the freedom to take some risks. Um, but you can't, but thinking about external capital, um, and I really want to stress this, if you never want to sell your business, if you think it's some kind of shortcut to success, if you don't want to have to answer to anyone else, and maybe funding isn't right for you, because you are bringing on business partners. And there's two mindsets, there's combative mindsets or inclusive mindsets. Some people will say, wow, having an investor on board really adds value to my business. Some people will say that is ruining my business. And depending on your mindset, um, well, maybe the difference between whether you should have an investor in your company or not. Um, so if you want to bootstrap, grow more slowly, um, you don't want someone having an eye over what you're doing um, and you don't want to give up some aspects of control, um, then think about whether investment's right for you. But if for those first reasons, you really want to grow fast and you want to do a, a great job, then would really think, really consider it for yourself. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Um, we can go one slide back, Josh. I don't know if we've skipped over one. Um, perfect. Cool. So you have decided that taking on investment is the right decision for you. Um, one of the first big questions that you might be asking yourself is, okay, well, how much is my company actually worth and how do I value it? When we're talking about valuation, we're talking about the value of your company as at today. So I'm not talking about the amount of money you want to take off an investor. It's yeah, how much is your company worth today? Um, for many startups, particularly early stage startups, their value really lies in their potential. 
um, which can only really be unlocked through growth. And then this basically makes startup valuation an incredibly speculative exercise. Traditional methods of valuation, so things like, you know, long-term profit and loss statements, um, asset valuations, these metrics just don't work for early stage companies. So as a founder, you might be sitting there asking yourself, well, if I don't have assets like machinery, like my assets is my IP, but I haven't unlocked its valuation, how do I value that? Or as an early stage company, I don't have years that show, you know, my revenue, my profit or losses. I've only been in existence for a couple of years. I just don't have this data. So the truth is that startup valuation is really driven by industry trends and a lot of blue sky thinking. Um, there are a bunch of I guess, positive and negative factors that investors will look at when trying to decide how much your startup is worth or how much your startup could be worth. Um, so I'll go through a few of these now. They're not sort of every single factor out there, but they are sort of the key factors. Um, so in terms of positive factors, one of the positive factors is, okay, is your startup in a hot or popular industry? So things like healthcare and artificial intelligence, for example, are really popular industries at the moment. And also, is there large market opportunity? Um, great if you can show market trends here. For example, with COVID, we've seen a lot more people working from home. So working from home tools have been on an upwards trend. Um, the next thing is team, which is really important. Do you have the people to execute on this idea? Um, and these are things like, you know, do you have the domain expertise? Do you have people who have run startups previously? You know, not a necessity, but it helps. Um, do you live and breathe the problem on a daily basis and really understand the ins and outs of it? Another one is a functioning product. So it's great if you have a functioning product and better still if you have proven traction and repeat users. If you have repeat users, this is basically indicating that, you know, you have a problem and it's a genuine problem and you have people who are coming back to solve that problem with you. A couple of negative factors. Um, might be a bit of an obvious one, but a poor performing sector. Um, and again, this goes back to trends. So for example, the NFT space was really hot and popular. It's crashed, not so popular anymore. Um, low margins in your industry. So is it really hard for you to make a profit because it's just, there's a really low margin on your product? Um, are you operating in a saturated market? Um, so you know, is there significant competition within your market and little difference between your product and the next? Um, we're starting to see this with buy now, pay later products, for example. And do you not have a product or you have a product, but you haven't tested it yet? So you really have minimal sort of validation and traction with that product. So there's some of the sort of positive and negative factors that investors might look at when trying to value your company. Um, I think it's probably helpful to also stop and really think about the state of the investment market today and where we're at. Um, as you, I'm sure you are all too well aware of, um, due to higher interest rates, there is less access to capital or it's not as easy to access that capital. Um, and this is not to say that startup investments like aren't out there and that early stage companies can't access investment. It just means that you have to position yourself really strongly and realize that the days of sort of overinflated valuations are over and investors, I guess now more than ever, have much more of a sway in setting the valuation. Um, I think if we look back to 2021 to, to now, investors are really reluctant to invest quickly. So the traditional rule was just sort of, high growth mentality at all costs. You know, you think of your WeWorks and your Ubers, it was just high growth, high growth. And then we eventually saw the crash of these big companies. So the renewed focus now is on sustainable growth. Investors really want to see businesses going back to really good basic business fundamentals um, and thinking about how can I sustainably grow with as little resources as possible? Um, and how is the investor's money going to contribute towards my sustainable growth? Awesome. So on this next slide here, we have a bit of a breakdown about, you know, staging size and valuation. So you thought your way through the minefield of valuation and you're thinking, okay, but who should I be targeting? You know, how much should I be raising? What percentage of my company should I be giving away? 
The answer to all of these questions really depends on the stage of your company and your results and your traction to date. So at the earlier stage, you're looking at that sort of pre-seed raise um, and that's from people like family, friends, and fools um, and accelerators and angel investors. So at this end of the scale, it's not so much about proven results and you know masses amounts of traction. These people are really investing in your idea and you as a founder or your founding team. Um, the focus for you here should really be on testing your idea um, and sort of exercising and see if you can get that traction. And traction isn't necessarily just through sales. There's other ways you can do it. You can go to market with sort of questionnaires, get customer feedback, do pre-sales. That's the type of traction you should be focusing on at this stage. Um, I think another thing to note with the types of investors here, so you've got your angel investors and your accelerators. Um, these people can be really valuable because they're investing at a really early stage and they want to see you set up for success. If you do well, they do well. Um, and they can be really valuable in that they provide ongoing mentorship and support um, to set you up for that success. So after the pre-seed, you're then looking at your seed raises or your series A raises. And you can see here that you have sort of more sophisticated investors come into play. So you have your VCs, for example, and your family offices. In order to secure a large C raise or a series A raise, um, at this point, you really should have a proven product um, and ideally a history of positive or promising revenue. Um, over the years, we've sort of seen these seed, larger seed raises and series A raises, the pool has been increasing. So the actual round size has been getting bigger, which is great news for us because it basically indicates that our ecosystem is maturing and catching up with our counterparts. Um, it also means that there's more of a standard benchmark when it comes to investor ownership. So for example, if I'm doing a series A raise and I'm giving away four to $20 million, you can expect to give away 15 to 25% of your company. So easier when it comes to sort of guidelines about how much equity you're giving away. Um, in the previous slide, I touched on sustainable growth. Um, and this also should be playing into your considerations around how much money do you need to raise. So a healthy runway is around sort of 18 to 24 months. That's a sustainable runway. So you need to ask yourself, how much money do I need to raise to, you know, get me to that what's 18 to 24 months and to grow sustainably within that period? Well, oh, thanks, Josh. I just realized I was on mute and I'm really glad that I didn't start talking while on mute. <laughs> Absolute blunder. Um, so what we've got here is a little bit about dilution and something that we need to become comfortable with as founders is that if you're taking investment, dilution is inevitable. And it's not to say that dilution is bad or a dirty word or something that you shouldn't think about at all. Um, because what dilution ultimately means, if you're successful in continuing raising rounds, is that you're getting a smaller piece of a larger pie. So let's walk through this. At the family and friends round, we've got FFF here, family, friends, and fools. We call them fools because sometimes they're just investing in you um, and they love you so much and they're giving you money to see, hopefully see you grow, but they don't actually know. Like even if I described to my mum what a startup is, she probably has not, she doesn't have any idea, I can tell you for sure. So she'd be in the family, friends, and fools category if, if I asked her for some money to build my business. Now, at the family and friends stage, the founders own 90% and the family and friends just own 10% of the business. Um, and that's really easy to see. 90% of 1 million makes your stake worth maybe 900,000. At the seed stage, you start to bring on seed investors. So as Belinda pointed out before, this could be angels or VCs um, coming in to um, join your business. Now, what this can mean is that when seed investors come on board, they'll often start to look at, ask you to implement things like an ESOP or an employee share option plan. What an ESOP is, is this um, amazing program to allow you to give shares to your employees. And what they say is like, you need to allocate 10, I've seen as low as five to 20% of your company um, to future employees to incentivize them to come and stay in your business. Now, it's really exciting for those employees to come, to come on board, but everyone who's an existing shareholder gets diluted by that. So family and friends are now diluted by 30% to 7%. Founders downloaded by 30, diluted by 30% to 63%. And if your series A comes along, everyone gets, 
everyone gets diluted again by 20%. So you can see here that seed investors now go down to 16%. The ESOP gets diluted and all the existing shareholders. Now, when we get to the end of that process, the founders own 50% of the business. Now, I ask you the question, is it better to have 90% of a $1 million company or 50% of a $20 million company? When we think about really popular cases, let's look at Slack, for example. The founders collectively held estimated between 15 and 25% of the business. Now, many, many founders who do reach this incredible scale and growth do, do experience significant dilution along the way, but they take that as the trade-off for getting that incredible growth that they're looking for. Now, here's something to really keep be across, is that there are different roles when you're taking on investment and being aware of these is super crucial. The first is you have the company, the startup. Your, your main role as a startup is to build an amazing pro product, craft an incredible story around your growth and your need for money. Um, and you might have a bunch of existing people already interested in your business. You might have prior investors or you might have advisors who have a little bit of money in your business. You might have employees who have shares in your business. Um, the startup is central to all of this and is what investors are investing in. The next kind of party that you have is the founders. Now the founders are different from the business itself. The founders hold shares in the business, but they're not necessarily the business itself. But what the founders are is crucial in getting investment. So it's crucial that they're doing the negotiation. If you're a founder, you should expect that you'll be talking to the VC and doing the negotiation, especially in the earlier stages of um, gaining capital. You're gonna be doing the pitching. Raising funding is very, it takes a lot of time. Um, and so what we recommend is that if you have multiple founders, one is focusing on fundraising, doing the negotiation, doing the pitching, and the others are focusing on the business. Now, if you only have one founder, you just have to be a bit more careful about how you split your time because it does take a lot of time. Um, the next kind of role is lead investors. Lead investors take out 30 to 40% of your round as a minimum. Um, and what they do is they usually cut the largest check your role as the founder is to negotiate with the key investor about what are the material terms of, that, of this investment? What are we negotiating about? What is important? What's not important? Usually the lead investor will lead that negotiation and the minor investors who provide smaller amounts of money will just follow on to what the lead investor says. We hope that most of the time, no minor investors are creating major roadblocks or challenges to an investment, um, especially at an early stage. Now, some lead investors do want to take a seat at your board. You remember, I might have mentioned before this combative or inclusive mindset. Um, and you might think about this as, oh my God, they're going to be at my board. They're going to take over control. Well, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they're going to come and add value and help drive you and help you set goals that are more aligned to the growth story that you want to see too. And so I invite you to ask yourself that question and what that means for you, uh, because it is quite normal for a lead investor to ask for a seat on the board. Cool, we've been through a bunch. We've spoken about a lot. And what we're gonna talk a little bit about now is um, how to make it happen. How do you actually get investment? Like, what does that actually mean? And so we're gonna give you a really high level overview of how to do that. Let's first understand the timeline of investment. Some people can get it done in a really, really short amount of time. But by and large, on average, raising investment is a six to 12 month process. And the reason that it takes that amount of time is that raising investment really can, is contingent on this one important thing, which is building amazing relationships. So you're gonna start by having coffees and maybe doing informal pitches or informal meetings, but it might be four months down the track before you start talking about term sheets, as in the key terms of the deal that you're agreeing to. Um, and it might take two months to go from term sheet to money in the door for you. Now, that might seem like a really long time, but if you imagine that if you have one lead investor and six minor investors and each of those has their own legal teams reviewing docs, asking questions, making sure that everything's good, there's a lot of players involved. And so it's really important that if you need investment, you know, and if you need investment, start thinking about the timeline on which you need it and how long it's going to take you to get there. This is going to be especially true in the first time you raise funding. Um, if you don't already have an existing network in the investment space, this is going to be crucial for you to understand. 
I like to use this analogy that sales and dating equals investment. I think that like, like the core message for both like dating and investment is that you need to build trust over time. I probably don't have to tell you all this, but the key thing is focusing on the relationship that you're building. And we're going to have a control and in April about building inve amazing investor relationships backed up by research with an amazing um, investor. Um, so you need to be able to give your investor confidence that you do have the ability, that you're the right and best option for them, just like dating. Um, you do have to understand whether you're ready or not, just like dating. If you're not ready to start dating, that's probably not going to be a good time for either party involved. You do need to understand if you're ready to raise funding now or in the future. Um, half in, half out, all it does is delay that timeline that I mentioned before. I've seen investments extend up to 18 months because a founder was not certain whether they were ready or not to invest. Um, other analogies that I love to use, you have to put yourself out there to meet the right first in the first place. Um, rejections can really hurt, but rejections hurt even more if you put all your eggs in one basket. So do be prepared around the approach. We'll talk about that next. Um, connections are strongest when introduced by a third party. So if you're going to meet investors, think about how you can meet them. There are plenty of different ways. Um, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, general inquiry, you might decide that the giant warm intro, which is run by Rampersand every year um, to meet an investor. Office hours, there are so many different ways to meet investors. Go to a co-working space where you know an investor works from and hassle them. Um, I, don't tell them I sent you, but I, I advocate for it. Um, you have to really put yourself out there. Um, and often you have to go on several dates before you meet the right person. No one's cutting a check on day one that you meet them. So it's gonna take a bit of time and a bit of practice um, to be able to get them. There's this amazing saying that investors invest in lines and not dots. And so what they'll wanna see is multiple points in your journey that they can join up into lines, not just single points in time that happen sporadically. So when we're thinking about meeting potential investors, five simple steps to follow. The first is make a list. Make a list of everyone that you'd love to chat to. It might be people in your industry. It might be existing angel investors. It might be VC funds. Think about your stage and who's appropriate for you to be actually reaching out to. Um, make that list. And the second point is start with the lowest priority. And the lowest priority isn't the least important person, but it's the least important one for your company. Um, and the reason is, is that often those meetings about investment take a little bit of practice. If you haven't done it before, getting a few meetings under your belt to give you the confidence that you, number one, know what questions are going to be asked. Um, number two, what kind of preparation you need to, you need to do. Um, always when you're going to these meetings, go on the person's LinkedIn, go on their Twitter, search articles about them, do your research, do your preparation, know who they are. There's nothing more embarrassing than going along to a meeting and getting the person wrong. Um, and so really, 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 encourage you to, to focus in on, on doing your research for each and every one that you are meeting. Get a warm introduction. Get someone else to introduce you who's already in contact with that investor. But that can be another founder. Um, that can be someone in your network. That can be a friend from high school that you haven't spoken to. It's worth just asking if they are that mutual connection. Get a warm introduction and send a deck to help give that investor a snapshot of who you are. Um, it really does help. It's like a little bit of a marketing tool, a pitch deck. Um, ask for advice, not investment. There's this amazing saying that if you ask for money, you'll get advice and if you ask for advice, you'll get money. More often than not, this rings true. And so I really encourage you to just um, think about, well, what value is this person bringing me now? What questions can I ask them to help move this investment conversation forward? And then follow up. From speaking to tens and hundreds of investors over the years, I would say anecdotally that less than 10% of founders ever follow up. This is as simple as saying, hey, um, thanks for meeting me. Here are the questions that you asked. I'll get back to you in three weeks. And then in three weeks, you get back to them and say, hey, hey here are the questions you asked. Here's what I found. I ran these tests. I did these things. I, I started to delve into what you said, and this is the results. Following up helps you stand out from the crowd, especially when the numbers are stacked against you, one in 100 gaining funding. You need a whole bunch of tools. And I think that it's really important to have these tools prepared when before you start raising funding. So you have an investor pipeline or CRM. This is like your investor list that you've put together that's customized to your needs, who's right for you. 
you have template intro emails. If you're asking for warm introductions, the easiest way for someone to do it quickly is to provide them a template to use that speaks of you in the best light. Number one, you control the messaging about your company. Number two, um, you make sure that you make sure that everything um, is easy for the person just to click send as quickly as possible. You have regular update emails. I'll talk about these in a sec. Pitch decks. Um, there are different forms for different moments, but I really recommend having these ready because if someone says, hey, this investor would like to meet you, can you send through your pitch deck and you don't have it? One, you might not be able to put your best foot forward or two, um, you and, and two, the result of that is that like you don't end up building trust, which is the whole aim of this process, especially in, in the initial, initial meetings. Um, then you have financial models. Um, having a well-built financial model and no investor is going to judge you, especially at an early stage, whether it's correct. But what you're doing is you're having a deeper conversation about the assumptions of your business. It will help you show that you've really thought through how your business works. So for example, if you have a have forecast a really low customer acquisition cost, you can explain why. And if an investor says that maybe your, assumption, your assumptions are wrong, you can plug in their assumptions and start to have a conversation about what that would mean for your business. Now, how powerful is that to have a deep conversation about something in your financial model rather than not understanding that at all? The next thing along is cap table. Cap table is essentially um, all the shares that have been issued or promised in your business. We see blunders in cap tables all the time, being messy, shares that are promised haven't been issued, founders don't set, own what they're expected to own. And you don't want to get down the track when you're ready to take the investment and the investors asking you during due diligence about your cap table and you just don't have it prepared. It can take teams weeks and weeks to get it all ready. Sometimes you need tax advice um, because transferring shares incurs tax. Highly recommend you just got it sorted out. Then we have a data room, which is... Um, Belinda will go into a bit, but I want you to remember that it's a part information, part marketing tool. So don't only include the core stuff, but if there's good articles, there's customer feedback, there's um, good publicity, chuck it in there. It can never hurt. So we spoke about keeping investors up to date. Um, I think having a monthly update email, especially when you're raising funding, is crucial because it helps you stay top of mind. It helps you solicit help and it provides a catalyst for people to actually offer help to you. So here's like a simple format that we've got highlights, challenges, next steps and asks. Um, but what you can do is you start joining those line, those dots into lines for an investor. They start to see your journey. How are you performing month on month? It's important to be um, totally truthful in how you're doing, be reflective. Is it going well? Is it not going well and why? So people can see the ins and outs of your business. Now, if you're going to paint a, a all rosy picture when it's really not, well, stuff comes out in the wash when it's time to get investment anyway. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. So what do you need in terms of um, sort of legal documents or what do you need to put in place once you've secured an investor? Um, the first thing that you'll do is negotiate a term sheet with your investor. So this is just a sort of one to two pager. It's not very long and it just sets out the key terms of the deal. Um, like Josh mentioned, you usually have a lead investor and that lead investor will heavily dictate what these key terms are. Um, and then it's a matter of, you know, once you've signed that term sheet off with your lead investor, you give it to your other smaller investors and the narrative is sort of take it or leave it at that point. Um, one thing to note with the term sheet, it's not legally binding. The whole purpose of a term sheet is just to make sure that everyone's on the same page at that very early stage. So once you've got your term sheet, you guys have signed it off, um, you'll look to set up your data room, which is pretty much just a fancy term for a Dropbox or a Google Drive folder, depending on how you want to set it up. And this is where all of your important information goes. So your company constitution or your previous shareholders agreement. As Josh just mentioned, a lot of the time you can put in documents which also are favorable to you. Um, so it is a bit of a marketing exercise as well. Um, and then once you've set up that data room, the investor will go into the data room and conduct something known as due diligence, which again, is just sort of a fancy term to say that the investor goes in, looks at your docs and makes sure that sort of everything lines up. Everything that you've said lines up and is reflected in those key documents. Um, once you've sort of finished your DD, everyone's happy. 
at that point, you're drafting what's known as sort of your long form transaction document. So these are two really key documents. The first is your subscription agreement. Um, this is basically your investors formally subscribing for your shares. But the important thing which gets included under this agreement is promises from one party to the other. So you basically you promise each other that everything you've said to date is accurate um, and true. So once you've done your subscription agreement, you're also drafting your shareholders agreement. Um, this is a really core document which basically says, okay, how's the company going to be run between me as the founder, my existing shareholders, if you have any, and the new investors. And usually pulls in a lot of the key terms from the term sheet. So, you know, who gets to make decisions on what? Does it like who's going to be sitting on the board? Did the investor get a board seat? All of that then gets formally reflected in the legally binding shareholders agreement. Um, so that's sort of the legal health check um, in a nutshell. Awesome. Thanks, Nina. And that's kind of what we've got around Investment 101. Now, what's really, really important is that we'll send through the slides after this, but take time to think about how you can apply this to yourself. If you have questions about the investment, and we'll take questions live now, but if you have additional questions that you want to answer, you want to ask one-on-one -on -one or anything like that, you can reach out to either Belinda or I um, about this stuff and we'd be more than happy to just set up a meeting and chat through it. Um, it doesn't cost you anything. It's really just add value, especially we know when you're at the early stage, there's a lot more unknowns than knowns and just working through that is so, so, so helpful. So Belinda, we have a few questions um, in the Q and A. Um, the first one is from an anonymous attendee um, and I'm not gonna read um, the, whole, uh, the whole question, but in short, um, they're pre-revenue startup, they're reaching the end of their runway. And the question is, do you have any advice on pitching at a pre-revenue stage or other ideas to keep the business alive? Yeah, definitely. I think this really goes back to proving traction, but not necessarily through sales. So if you have this great pre-revenue idea, have you gone to market? Have you got customer feedback? Um, there's other ways to prove traction. It doesn't have to be through sales. And that piece is going to be really important when you go back to the investor to say, not only do I have a great idea, but you know, look at all the feedback I'm getting from people, my customers or potential customer base. Yeah. And so you can think about other ways to, to prove traction. You can think about signups, um, you can think about letters of intent, which are intent to work with you in the future if you have the product built, signed by the potential customers, um, or, or, or all that, um, that different, um, those surveys and interviews and things like that. Now, when you're pitching at a pre-revenue level, it's really important to go back to the stage that you're at. So if you're pre-revenue, there's going to be certain types of investors that are right for you and certain types that just aren't, especially for pre-revenue, we see the by far the largest source of pre-revenue funding in Australia is from family and friends. Um, so you might look very first to your close network. Is there anyone here that can help you out in exchange for equity in your business? If that's the case, amazing. If not, then let's look at other ways to get there. You might look at an accelerator program. Um, there are plenty of accelerator programs all around Australia. Or you might look to angel investors. Now, when you're looking out to angel investors, you can go, um, and there are plenty of different ways to find angel investors, um, the Air Tree Investor Angel List. Um, generally in Australia, the, the notion is that we have a low number of professional angels. So people who do it as a living. So there's a funny term that says people find out they're an angel investor on the first time they invest. So look in and understand your industry and look to who, who's made money from the industry, who's doing well in that industry. Can they help you? Um, and could you solicit advice from them in the very first stage about your business um, before you start having conversations about funding? Um, and that's going to take time. It's going to take effort. LinkedIn is by far the best tool for doing all that kind of stuff and highly recommend um, looking into it. Um, the next question, Tim. Tim, you've got some questions about, um, you know, investments coming in tranches. Uh, and in your specific circumstance, um, what I'm seeing here is that it's very common for, invest it's not very common, it's, it does happen for um, investments to happen in different tranches or in different stages of your business. Um, what we recommend is maybe if we just have a bit more of a chat um, after this, and Tim, if you want to reach out to us, we'll share our um, emails at the very end. Um, we've got a question from Adam 
Velastro. And Adam says, when raising pre-MVP, um, what is the runway that you should be looking for? Belinda, did you want to answer that one? Yeah, yeah. So pre-MVP, I guess your next big goal is really creating that product. So it's a little bit different. You don't need to be tied to the 18 to 24 month runway, but you should at this point be focusing on, okay, how am I going to get myself to the point where I have the MVP? Um, again, if you're at that really early stage, you are probably raising from family or friends and maybe an angel investor. So you're not going to have to prove so stringently like that I'm taking this money on for 18 to 24 months. The focus really should be creating that product. Most definitely. And I think when you're looking at your runway um, prior to taking investment, look at the different types of investments that you might take. Adam, like a, a safe might be a really good method for you to get money in the door quickly so that you can get over that six month hurdle of building that MVP. And then you can start raising funding when, when, um, when you've started to do that. So look at the tool that you're using as much as the runway that you need to get to that stage where you're gonna be investor ready or investable. Um, um, I'm looking through some of these uh, questions. Would a data room be helpful to share when dating investors, when you're going on that journey? Belinda, do you have any thoughts there? Um, Yes and no. At those very initial stages, like when you're just having that first meeting, you don't really want to overload them and say, you know, in that first meeting, and here's a Dropbox with a hundred documents in it. Uh, usually it will actually be the investor telling you when they want to start seeing documents and they'll really lead that request. Um, but that's not to say that if you've got a really few key documents, you know, forecasts, um, the history of revenue, you should definitely take those documents to meetings to help sort of support your, your pitch. And yeah, like building on that, I think it is very much in that, in that dating um, aspect, a lot like a sales process. So you do have to sell yourself and your journey, the reason why, and build a relationship first and foremost, that means that you can rely on that investor and that investor can rely on you. Um, so I'm just moving through this. Paul Field has asked, do valuations include existing profitable businesses plus technology developed by that business, in this case, to pilot stage? So Paul, am I understanding correctly that you're asking um, how do startup valuations also work similarly for profitable businesses um, that have already built technology? You can answer that in the chat um, while we go. And we are going to roll on. We have time for just two more questions. Um, David has asked, I'm considering a friend and family round as a pre-seed type stage. Which components of your standard fundraising process do you think you can skip if pursuing a family and friends round versus a more formal process, Belinda? Really good question. So the formalities and, you know, making sure you have each of those steps in DD, a lot of them do fall away. Um, if it's a family and friends round, you might look to have a term sheet just so everyone is still, you know, on the same on the same page with the investment. Um, and then really it's just the subscription agreement and the shareholders agreement. If you're doing a priced equity round, you can do away with sort of the DD side of things. Um, Often, again, if it's at that family and friend stage, you might be doing price equity, which involves those things I just talked about, or it's just a simple safe note, um, which Josh has mentioned as well. Great. Um, okay. So coming back to Paul's question, before we do close off, Paul's asked, um, how do you value a business that's already profitable? Paul, it's really common for startups to come in at any stage of the journey. So you would see before that on that slide where Belinda spoke about the different stages and the different types of investors. Um, what we know from that is that that's not a linear process. You don't have to start at family and friends to get to series A. There is the case that many founders do enter at different stages having already built profitable businesses. Um, so when we speak about valuations, what actually having a profitable business and customers already means that you're getting a better valuation, giving away less percentage. Now the stage that you're up to really be dictated by where your product's at. So if you're in the pilot stage and say you've just got your first few customers, you're probably gonna be at that seed stage or even, um, even a little bit earlier. Um, so really important there just to, um, just to think about if I'm profitable, that's one point in your positive in relation to the valuation. And, 
really means that you can get a much greater valuation um, initially. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to all the questions today, but we really did try. I answered 23, including responding to what people are eating and drinking today. Um, so what I do want to do before we close off here, I'm going to share this other screen.